Alright, so boom, well gone, bro, perfect. Now, there are things that you know that you know, then there are things that you know that you don't know. Like when you're studying for an exam, you don't know the stuff. But also, there are things you don't even know that you don't know, such as when you don't even know what material is going to be on the exam, and you don't even know what to study for. <laughs> and those are the things that you don't even know that you don't know are the things that hurt you the most. Now, a lot of people think they have an income issue. They think you need to make more money, make more money. If only I made 100K a year, I'd be blessed. Bankrupt. No more money. We've got to have money. But most people have a money management issue. You spend more than you are living. You're living above your means. So if you can ex scrap your expenses to its bare minimum first, and then start looking at other ways to make more money, then you will start living paycheck to paycheck. And that concludes the video. Okay, that's it, that's, that, that's it, that's it. I'm turning off the video, it's all good. Later, bye. I'm just playing. Obviously there are nuances to every situation and certain people have more advantages while others have disadvantages. But that is essentially how you start living paycheck to paycheck. You take account of all the unnecessary spending and the fun spending and the subscription services that you'd be using and you <clears throat> revise your daily spending habits. Anytime you wanna spend money, ask yourself how much time would it take me to get that money back? If something costs $100, how many hours of life, if you work at a regular job, would it take you to make that money back? For most people, that's like 10 hours of life. Is this item worth 10 hours of your life? <laughs> and then go accordingly. But let's get into it. Graham Stevenson, how to start living paycheck to paycheck. What's up guys, it's Graham here. So let me tell you a quick story about what just happened. I was going about my day, a normal day, just like any other, and I decided to open up the internet to see what people were talking about, what was happening in the world. And by pure chance, when I opened up my computer and then took the initiative to go to www.cnbc.com slash make it, there it was just glaring back at me from the glowing light of my computer screen in big, bold font. Nearly one in three American workers run out of money before payday, even those earning over $100,000. And once I read that, I was appalled. It was like a train wreck you can't help but look at while you sit there and wonder to yourself, why haven't I already smashed the like button for the YouTube algorithm? And then after doing that, you shift your focus back to another alarming question. How can someone earning over $100,000 a year still be living paycheck to paycheck? It doesn't make any sense. After all, maybe this wasn't the entire picture because the survey only gathered data from 2,700 US adults working in companies with over 500 employees. Maybe that has something to do with it. And if we just broadened our horizons, we might see a different outcome. So I went back to my number one trusted private investigator research tool, otherwise known as Google, and continued to dig up more information, and that's where things got worse. Google took me to an even larger study conducted by Career Builder, which found that 78% of all US workers live paycheck to paycheck. And that encompasses everybody, not just people who work at companies that employ more than 500 people. And that is absolutely unacceptable if I have anything to do with it, which I don't really have anything to do with it. But at the very least, we could discuss why so many people are living paycheck to paycheck, the research behind this, and if you ever find yourself in this predicament, what you can actually do about it so that you're never going to have to live paycheck to paycheck ever again. So first, let's go over the article by CNBC, which goes over the data from employees who work at companies that hire more than 500 people. Obviously, the fact that one out of every three of these workers is living paycheck to paycheck is pretty staggering. Although once you dive a little bit deeper into the data behind this, what I found, at least, was pretty shocking. According to research, a higher percentage of people making over $200,000 a year run out of money before their next paycheck than the employees who are making between $40,000 and $55,000 a year. Not only that, but the percentage of people living paycheck to paycheck is almost consistent throughout every single it's funny how when you have less you are forced not even by choice but you are forced to be more creative with your money you have money lying around with excessive money you're just like okay what can i do with this money you just kind of you kind of get bored right go crazy ah, 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 go stupid ah, go crazy go stupid ah, 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 go crazy yeah go stupid uh. go <laughs> that's when you see all these athletes or some of these like people who have are wealthy they have pet tigers or pet like a pet a pet monkey <laughs> like what am i gonna do with a pet monkey stuff like that right so when you have extra extra money and you aren't accustomed to managing with, with like less you start you know you just spend whatever right and you all of a sudden okay so i'm making 200k now i have to live and operate like someone is making 200k you don't need to do that. Just live on, just live on the regular like 100k. Live, live as if you're making. If you make 10k a month, live as if you're making 5k or, or 6k, and then put that money towards investing. You know? Give it to a charity that you trust, that you trust, <laughs> and stuff like that, right? So 
low income bracket. Which really makes you think, how are there just as many people struggling at $160,000 a year as there are at $40,000 a year? Shouldn't the person who's making four times more money not have to worry about these things? And shouldn't you be less likely to live paycheck to paycheck with the more money that you make? Well, speaking about being concerned about these problems, when surveyed, it was found that being concerned about the situation was also almost consistent throughout every income bracket, regardless of how much money they make. Which just goes to show you that more money doesn't always lead to more problems. In fact, you have the exact same amount of problems. Our other survey doesn't make things look any better either, with three and four workers saying that they're in debt. But here's where things get interesting, because it seems like we're just going down this bottomless pit of emptiness and despair until I came across a question that started to make some sense. And now all of this data begins adding up. When asked, it was found that only 32% of the nearly 3,500 full-time workers who were surveyed use a budget. Or in other words, if we flip this one around, two thirds of people are not tracking where their money is going. Now I'm not gonna go so far as to suggest that creating a budget and tracking your spending is going to solve everyone's money concerns and problems. But given that 78% of American workers are living paycheck to paycheck and 68% of American workers don't have a budget, I think it's potentially safe to conclude that there's some level of correlation between the two and that a lack of a budget maybe coincides with a lack of leftover money every month. But of course, we should try to dig a little bit deeper to figure out where this is coming from. And to do that, I went back to my handy private investigator research tool of Google to pull up the Modern Wealth Survey by Charles Schwab. And what they found was that in terms of spending, social media had the most negative influence on money management, with nearly 50% of millennials saying they're more likely to spend money on experiences from something they saw on Instagram, and almost half would spend more money to do things with their friends. And obviously, there's a bit of a cognitive dissonance going on here because almost 60% of those people consider themselves savers, and 65% said that they were willing to sacrifice spending now in order to save money for the future. Although I suppose, as much as people think they would like to cut back, a lot of them don't and won't. According to the very same study, the average American is spending almost $500 a month on non-essential spending. And when asked what they would not give up on spending, regardless of their financial situation, 21% said that they would not give up cable, 19% said that they'd continue going to eat out, 17% said that they'd still travel, 13% said that they'd continue education, 13% also said that they would continue buying gifts for people, and 11% said that they'd continue spending money on alcohol. Don't buy me gifts. Give me money to use on paying my bills. <laughs> Yo, some of y'all may be new to your channel. Maybe you've never heard my my uh my story. Man's, I had I had credit card debt, and I did some extreme measures to pay that credit card debt earlier because I didn't have because I didn't have the my income wasn't high enough, right? So as a result, I went to a homeless shelter. <clears throat> it was there for like four, I think about six months or so. And you know, when you had a homeless shelter, it's like, yeah. <laughs> so I know, I understand what it means to cut back and really like focus your energy on your financial goals, right? And that allowed me to, you know, ultimately handle my other shit. Cause rather than paying rent, which, you know, is cool and having a place to stay, I was like, let me just use this money to beat up this debt as quickly as possible. So, once you've had your aha moment, once you've had your, this is enough, I'm tired of living like this moment, then you'll take action. Like you could watch this video and still continue going to Starbucks, still continue eating out, still continue paying for Netflix, when you could torrent it <laughs> and stuff like that. Once you are in a situation where it's almost like dire or you maybe have a kid now and you have to strap up or you know you have debt that is like crippling you or you're about to get married, then once you have that moment, then you you will definitely try and do better. But unless you have unless you have that aha moment or that this is enough moment, you're still not gonna do anything about it. Hopefully, hopefully not, but most people won't. Which makes you think, how many people living paycheck to paycheck have an income problem, or instead, maybe they actually have a spending problem? Especially if two thirds of people do not track their spending or have a budget, and the average American is spending $500 a month on non-essential items that could otherwise be saved and invested. Well, in a way, it could certainly be both, but it's not helping that financial literacy skills have been declining over the last decade, with millennials seeing the largest drop in education. And even though less than 35% of adults could answer basic money questions correctly, 71% of participants gave themselves a high score when assessing their money savvy in 2018. So there's obviously a big disconnect between how well people think they handle money and how well they actually handle money. And this is, at its core, what's known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. And these are the topics I love talking about, because as much as we want to believe that personal finance is just looking at numbers and calculating them on a computer screen, I believe a big component of that is emotional and psychological. So going back to the reason why people think they're better at handling money than they actually are, here's why. The Dunning-Kruger effect finds that low performers are unable to recognize their own competence, which is the reason why they view themselves as better and more knowledgeable than others. Or in other words, the very knowledge and skills that it takes to be good at a certain task are the very same qualities it takes to recognize that you are not so good at the task. So if a person lacks that ability in the first place, not only are they going to be bad at the task at hand, but also ignorant to their own badness. On the other side of the spectrum though, those that are experts and are knowledgeable on a subject actually tend to underestimate their own abilities because they assume in relation to themselves that everyone else is just as equally knowledgeable as they are. So this definitely goes both ways and all of us fall into this in one subject or another. But since personal finance is the topic of this video and personal finance is a skill that's been declining over the last decade, it is not surprising that financial literacy is down while at the same time our inability to recognize that is up. So without going into any more mumbo jumbo on research and studies, here's what I think is going on. First, it's not surprising that just as many people are living paycheck to paycheck at $200,000 a year as there are at $50,000 a year. Even though I don't have any conclusive research to back this up, I believe that the type of person to overspend at $50,000 a year is just
just as likely to overspend at $200,000 a year. Which is why overall spending increases in proportion to your income. Even if they're barely scraping by at $200,000 a year, increasing their income to $500,000 is not going to solve the underlying issue. This could even be a derivative of Parkinson's law, which states that our work expands to fill the time allotted for it. Or in this case, our spending expands to fill the available income. And once you're on that path, it's really difficult to get off. That's what she said. Okay, stupid jokes aside, this is otherwise what's known as the Diderot effect. It's a psychology that when you go and buy one nice item, it makes everything else look less nice in comparison. So that then causes you to upgrade everything else to be on the same level of niceness. And from that, we This is especially true if you are in your dating, right? Just you get into the habit of, yo, let me buy this shit to make myself look more high value, quote unquote, right? But when you lead with your money, when you lead with like your what you have, you tend to get girls who like you for that shit first. That's why uh, like going forward, as I'm making more money from YouTube and stuff like that, I just lead with my personality, lead with my, my, my persona. And then they'll gradually, I guess they'll find out at some point that I have money. But by then I would have already like gotten to know them a bit more. They would have gotten to know me a bit more. And it's not, it's not like a materialistic type of, t type of thing. And even the girls, like, the girls and guys that you're dating, what are their personal finance behaviors like? Is this someone that you can actually go with long term or even just be around them often? Do they make you money conscious? Are they money conscious? And that's something to think about before you even get into a relationship, let alone marriage. Because we know marriage is a business. It's not for love, it's for business, okay? <laughs> it's, it's a business. Love is a component, but the business aspect is, is, what's, what's, <laughs> is what's most prominent in marriage of consuming way more than we originally anticipated. Like when you go and buy one piece of furniture and then you realize, wait a second, I need other nice furniture to go with this and you continue doing that. And then you continue doing that and then eventually you need a new house to fit all of your nice furniture. So the only way to break the cycle is to not give into lifestyle inflation and make a very conscious effort not to spend any more money regardless of how much you end up making. The same thing also applies to worrying about money. I'll be the first to tell you, you will always have a similar level of money worry no matter how much money you make. This is human nature and applies to so much more than just money. In fact, if you want another psychology lesson today, this is what's known as prevalence induced concept change. In a way, this suggests that as our problems go away, our mind creates and expands other more minor problems to make make them seem worse than they actually are. Therefore, our baseline level of what we worry about is always going to stay the exact same. Let's say you worry about not making enough money and then all of a sudden you make enough money. Now you're still gonna worry the exact same except your worry is going to shift from I'm not making enough money to how can I not lose this money? Or your <laughs> mind could just create other problems for you to deal with because the human brain can't cope with everything going too perfectly for too long. The same phenomenon also works in reverse as well. Like when bad things become a common occurrence, they just might not seem as bad to you and other things might seem more pressing. However, this could pose a few problems. Number one, it might make us worry about things that are not really that bad. And second, it might normalize things that should be concerning but are not because they're so common like not smashing a like button for the YouTube algorithm. So at least from that perspective, we can understand the psychology behind why people can't save money, why they spend as much money as they make, despite how much money they make, and why people are always going to worry about money until the end of time. But if you take a proactive approach to fixing this problem, it can make a difference. Here's the thing, I don't want to dismiss the issues of wage inequality, wage stagnation, or other macroeconomic issues that we largely just don't have control over. Because those certainly do exist and do make an impact on how much money we save and spend. However, at this point, I'm a firm believer in focusing on the things that we have full control over now, and what we can actually do to take a positive step in the right direction today. And part of that comes with taking responsibility for our own actions, and realizing that we could direct our finances in any way we choose, and all of that begins with budgeting. Since less than one third of the workers surveyed had a budget and 78% of them are living paycheck to paycheck, I think making a budget should be the very first thing on the list for anyone who wants to break that cycle. To me, that's even more important than finding a new job or making more money. Because again, if the underlying problem isn't solved, it's like- The first way to like look at your budget is look at the fixed expenses, the things that are every month you need to live to in order to, 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 in order to survive, right? Rent or mortgage, um, food, right? Uh, maybe probably Wi-Fi, you need Wi-Fi. <laughs> look at the fixed expenses that are guaranteed that to come every day. And then once you look at your expenses, what, what what part of those expenses could you like do without and not need in your life, right? And then once you've done that shit, dealt with the expenses, I look at your income. And is there a way for you to increase your income, whether it be from online stuff, doing uh, focus groups, like in-person surveys, stuff like that. Um, or getting picking up a side hustle, right? So deal with your expenses, look at it as like the nitty gritty, like I need this, or I'm gonna be out on the street, or I need this, or I will be able to function, and then get rid of the, the lesser, like minuscule expenses. And then once you are okay for a bit, you can look into getting a side hustle or increasing your income in other avenues, right? So uh, shout out to Graham for giving the psychology of it. But that's essentially what it is, man. This is how you stop living paycheck, paycheck to paycheck. And on top of that as well, right? Don't be too comfortable in your job. You just always want to be in a ha get in the habit of looking for other ways to make money. Don't be too don't be too comfortable. Whether you had a government job, you have the you have the pension, the salary, stuff like that. Always look for other avenues, at least a second or third source of income. But yo, God bless. Much love, peace, and joy. Namaste. God bless.
Does it feed you? Don't water it. And too much of any good thing is good for nothing. How are you doing today? Hopefully you're doing more and saying less. <laughs> Deuces my G.